Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Um, I want to talk about some different libraries in Ruby that are kind of underappreciated, and um, I want to show you what kind of things we can make them do for us. So that's what this is about. I'm back at Lone Star, which I'm really excited about. Those who don't know me, I'm James Edward Gray II. I created the Ruby quiz originally and ran it for three years, though it's uh, run by Matthew Moss now, so I don't, don't do that anymore, but I started it. I've released a few open source libraries, including the faster CSV that was mentioned earlier, and uh, written a couple of pragmatic programmer books that have quite a bit of Ruby in them. Uh, I've talked at every Lone Star Ruby conference so far. How cool is that? Um, <laughs> you guys really don't realize what a miracle that is. I came down here last year and talked for one hour on the TV show Heroes, and they invited me back this year. So uh, that was pretty cool. We can't talk about Heroes this time because, uh, well, season two sucked, right? So can't do that. Um, so I figured we'd go with this. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And we might also talk about some of this, but more about Star Galactica, of course. Um, for those who don't know Battlestar Galactica, the new show, is there, is there anybody who hasn't seen Battlestar Galactica? Raise your hand if you've not seen. Oh my god, wow. Okay, you guys got homework. Um, in fact, you may have to miss the next talk. Um, okay, so uh, in Battlestar Galactica, the humans created the Cylons. Uh, the Cylons got tired of the humans, and uh, they kind of separated. And then uh, at the beginning of the new series, the Cylons come back to wipe out the human race, OK? This show has to be the most depressing show on TV. Um, it's, it's terrible. They, it starts at the end of the world and goes downhill from there. Uh, OK. So why am I talking about Battlestar Galactica at the Ruby conference? Um, the Battlestar Galactica, the ship that these people are on, was to be decommissioned. It was their ancient junk, basically. And it's now the only thing keeping the humans alive, right? It's their last holdout. Um, and those of you who know me know that I love those kind of odds. I, I love the underdogs, so those are my kind of thing. But what does that have to do with Ruby? Well, you may have actually heard this rumor. It's going around. Um, has anybody heard that? It really might be slow. Yeah, I don't know. I've heard a couple of people say that. This is uh, my opinion of that rumor. Um, yeah, it's total crap. Uh, it, some of you may remember the slides actually like right out of my talk from last year. I thought that was cool. Um, anyways, Ruby goes as fast as we want it to, okay? Because we're in charge of that. Some people say you can speed up Ruby by switching to C. But you can actually use C from inside Ruby, so I guess we don't even need to switch. Um, but you don't really need that very often. Um, you can use other libraries. Some of them are written in C, so that's like using C without having to do C. Uh, and if they're specific to your problem, they can speed things up. We can always add more processing power, right? That's a big trend these days. Computers are cheap. CPUs are easy to come by. You can always do that. The big win, of course, in my opinion, is always um, adding better data structures, restructuring the problem to better fit what you're trying to do. Um, so we're going to talk mostly about this last one, but through the eyes of the other two, using libraries and processing power, and show you some ways to speed Ruby up. So some tools you can use to do that are uh, an array, SQLite, RBTree, FSDB, Renda, and then the most important tool for all of us is always thinking outside the box, right? That's the, the number one skill you got to have as a programmer. Um, so let's talk about an array. Um, we'll start there. That's numerical array uh, is what the N stands for. Um, and it's really good for numbers crunching. The Cylons have a huge advantage over the humans. They have uh, 
not girls, it's numbers. Um, yeah. It's numbers. We'll get to the girls later, okay? Um, most of the human race was wiped out in the initial attack, and Cylons don't die. If they die, they just download to another body, so they just come back. So they have these great number advantages. So sometimes you just gotta crunch some numbers. Everybody knows that. Um, Ruby's numbers were built for ease of use, which is nice, and we appreciate that and love using them. Um, but unfortunately, that makes them a bit slower because they have to do things like automatically convert between fixed num and big num or um, coerce different types and things like that. So there's more to do, and it, they're a bit slower. Something like C's numbers were built for speed, right? They uh, can only go so big, and they move really fast and stuff like that. Um, we can actually borrow C's numbers inside Ruby using N array. That's what it's for, um, to make a whole bunch of C's numbers and do really fast number crunching. So to give an example problem, uh, I have this PPM image library that's very simple. Uh, if you don't know the PPM image format, it's the one you can learn in like 30 seconds, uh, which is the reason I use it. It's just a big grid of numbers, basically, and you can generate images from it. And this little wrapper library I have, it's under 100 lines of code. I noticed it was taking about 1.3 seconds to generate a 400 by 200 pixel image. So I said, I want to see if I can speed that up. I switched from using a two-dimensional array of color objects, that was how I was defining the image data, to a three-dimensional N array, and used that instead. It, uh, I didn't had to change like 10 lines of code. It wasn't hard at all. I'm going to show you all the changes I made. Um, and the same image now creates in uh, about a hundredth of a second. Okay, so that's a pretty big speed difference. Um, and it's not hard to do. So, how do we change it? This is the initial code. And the line in particular that we're interested in is the very last one creating a two-dimensional array, right, by width and height. And then we store, I stored color objects in, in those positions of the array and then uh, converted them when they got ordered out, written out. Um, if we change it to use an array instead, notice that we have to add two requires. We're requiring Ruby gems and requiring an array. An array has been made into a gem, by the way, so you can install it normally with just gem install an array. Don't do that right now, um, but you can do that. Um, and then the last line changes to this, right? Uh, an array has several constructors depending on the size and type of numbers you want. In this case, I just need bytes for an image. And this is a three-dimensional an array. So the first dimension is the width, second one's the height, and then the third one is just three pixels wide or three bytes wide to cover RGB values of color, right? So the other change we had to make was marking pixels. Um, initially, I would mark pixels like this. The array was in row major, so you use the Y and then the X and then just assign the color to that spot. This line changed uh, very little in the N array version. It now looks like this. The difference is that I'm slicing into my N array and I use all the dimensions together and I grab three of the bytes instead of just one and then replace them all with an array. You can do array assignment. So, change all three of these numbers to the values of this color. And the only other change that you have to make to do something like this is in the drawing code. Um, originally, I would iterate over the rows in my image, uh, stringify the content, and print them out. And the new code is pretty much the same. The difference is that with an array, iterating is almost always best done by slicing your array in the way that will help you the most. In this case, I do a kind of a three-dimensional slice, um, get the entire width, just one version of the Y, so one row, and then all three colors. I have to transpose it because when I do that slice, it comes back as a two-dimensional array because we took two out of the equation, and it comes back colors by width, but I want it width by colors. So. I use an array's transpose, and it lets you arbitrarily reorder the dimensions however you want. And then the printing it out is basically the same. An array can convert itself to just a byte string, so that's really all you need here. Um, an array has a lot of other nice features. 
Um, you saw me using it with bytes. It can work with other size integers, two byte integers, four byte integers, floats. It even does complex numbers. Uh, I showed a little bit of indexing and iteration. It does data generation, arithmetic, comparisons, bitwise uh, manipulations, and statistics. Um, so there's really quite a bit of number crunching you can do with it. It has a pretty large API, um, and it's online, so you can go see it. Um, on Ruby Forge, there's also examples there, so you can play around with them. But actually, the easiest way to learn Inarray, if you want my trick, is um, just open IRB and make a tiny Inarray, 3x3 three three or something, and then start doing things to it, like add one to it and watch what happens. Try to add two Inarrays together and watch what happens. You get the hang of it real quick just playing with it. Um, I'm going to show one more Inarray example. This one's actually out of the examples that are online for Inarray. Um, there's an implementation of Conway's Game of Life using just Inarray. Uh, it does imaging and everything. It's pretty neat. I've very much simplified it here. I'm just going to show you one step. Um, but this is how you can do the Game of Life with Inarray. Um, this code right here does what I mentioned before, the uh, data generation. Um, you can I've made a 5x5 five five area here just so it's small and fits on a slide well. Um, and then I take the center three pixels by slicing into that array and generate random ones and zeros uh, to stick in there. So you can see that ends up looking like this. And I get some cells in the center. I'm not using the outer edges. Those are just in there to make my math easier. So the center 3x3 three three is actually where the game would be played. This code right here does all the counting you need for the game of life. And it does it by continually slicing the N array over and over again to get the cell to your upper left, and then the cell straight above you, then the cell to your upper right, et cetera, until you have all the neighbors. And you just add all those together, and you end up with these counts right here. And you can see all the neighbor counts are in the proper spot and tell you how many neighbors there is. And then even cooler, um, this is the actual implementation of one step of the game of life using Inarray. Um, when you do comparisons with Inarray or bitwise operations or arithmetic or whatever, it does those operations across the entire array. So you, um, you just have to compare. If there's three neighbors, then there's going to be a guy there no matter what. If he was there, he survives. If not, one's born. If there was two neighbors and a guy there before, then you get a new one. And that works like this, it changes the array to this. So this is you know, a lot of work done with just some simple slicing and arithmetic. And you can get just ridiculous speeds out of it. So uh, it's very worth it. Another way to get great speed um, out of Ruby is to use SQLite. Um, this is a really underloved library. I think some of us use it in Rails sometimes, but we have a tendency to use it behind an ORM, which is kind of a shame because it's kind of cool if you get it out of that. And let me show you what I mean. Um, so thinking about that is pretty hard, right? Uh, this is Gaius Baltar. He like betrayed the human race in the Cylon attack. So I can't believe you guys haven't seen Battlestar. <laughs> um, now I have to explain all this stuff. Um, so anyways, he does all this time thinking and uh, trying to stay one step ahead of the humans, and that's a full-time job. SQLite um, has already solved a lot of problems about data storage, right? So uh, it's kind of like you're already one step ahead of the problems um, if you use SQLite. And it gives you an entire language to express your needs for your data or play around with your data. Uh, so that ends up being very important. Um, and you can, the reason I love to use it is when I don't know what I'm going to need. Because I can start off describing my data in one way and putting it in tables. And then when I realize something else is going to happen, I've got to do something different. It's very easy for me to move that data around, change it, change the language I'm using, add an index, whatever. So let's show a real example of this. Um, this was an old Ruby quiz, the IP to country problem. And the idea was that given some IP address, we want to return the company, uh, country that IP is registered to. There's an online database for this. It's just a giant CSV file. Um, but we wanted to, uh, this being a quiz, we wanted to kind of make it tricky and see if we could do it efficiently in memory and speed and things like that. 
And even though it was a quiz, this is actually a task I pulled for my job. We do um, some site analysis on visitors to a website, and um, this is one of the things we do. A lot of blogs use this trick now, too, right, and show different images depending on where you're coming from. So the data looks kind of like this. Um, it's just, and this is just a few lines of it. The real file is about six megabytes. Um, and it gives you ranges, the beginning IP address to the ending IP address. This may not look like it, but that's an IP address right there. They're encoded as a four byte integer, right? So each part of the IP is then uh, part of the integer, and that's it. For solutions for this problem, um, a lot of people solved the Ruby quiz with a binary search um, on the file, um, and that was fast, obviously. Binary search is fast, right? Um, many of them pre-process the file to make that easier. Um, if you just do a normal binary search, you're going to land in the middle of a line most times. So then you got to figure out how to get to the next line and make sure you're not accidentally sometimes skipping over one line. To make that all easier, a lot of them pre-read the file and took the beginning IP, the end IP, and the two character country code. You could pack that into two four byte integers and then the two bytes for the country code. 10 bytes, each line was 10 bytes and then you could use simple math to jump right to a line. That's because they're a lot smarter than I am. Um, so I, I couldn't think all that out. Um, so I tried it with SQLite just to see how it would do. And uh, I gotta tell you, I was pretty surprised. I thought, wow, I wonder how hard it'll be to make SQLite go as fast as uh, those binary solutions went. The answer was not hard at all. Um, the very first thing I tried was the, pretty much the exact same speed, about one third of a second uh, to find a country for an IP address. I didn't have to be clever. I didn't even have to put an index on any of the columns, which I was really surprised by. Um, so just very simple, straightforward SQL. Um, and it was easier for me to use the full country names, right? Those who pre-processed the file, they went with the country code because they knew it would be a certain size. Um, but I could use the whole name. I didn't care. I was sticking it in some SQL table, so I did. So the setup code looks like this. Um, nothing interesting here, I don't think. A bunch of requires for different libraries I'm going to use. The important one is the last one, SQLite uh, 3. There's another driver for SQLite 2, but 3 has a bunch of cool features, including Unicode support and stuff, so I recommend going with 3. Um, here's the part where we actually build the database. Um, this part up here creates the database. All you have to pass in is the name of a file, right? SQLite is an entire database and one file. So you pass the name of the file and that's your database. Um, and then I'm just executing a statement. This is what executing a statement looks like in SQL. If you don't really care about the return value, I'm just executing a statement to create a three uh, field table, right? Low IP, high IP, and the country name. This code does the loading. Um, the part above where I have highlighted is just using the open URI library and gzip reader so I can read the CSV file directly from the internet zipped and don't even have to save it locally. I use faster CSV to parse out the CSV data and pull the pieces I'm interested in and then you can see my insert right here. I'm inserting entries into the table. This shows a couple of new things. Um, you can see I use positional values, those question marks in my SQL statements or placeholders and then I pass the arguments for those placeholders at the end of the execute call. That's loading the whole database. And then this is the part that actually does the query, again, at about one one-third of a second. Um, so uh, the query here, SQLite has a helper called get first value. So if you're just going to you know, do a query for one particular number or field name or something, you can call this get first value. And it returns just the first thing in the first row uh, in the query. And um, this time I use some parameters again, but I use name parameters. SQLite can do that too. Um, so I use my name parameter and then I pass in a hash for those values. And that's how they come back. There's a lot of things people don't know about SQLite and that's really a shame. For example, SQLite is totally free. And I don't mean like free as in free speech or free as in um, beer. I mean free as in freedom. Um, anybody who writes code for SQLite signs an affidavit relinquishing copyright and putting their code in the public domain. 
and those are all kept in a fire safe uh, at the main developer's office. Um, so SQLite is free. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, you can receive query results, especially through the Ruby driver, as a hash. So you can work with it by name instead of by index position. Um, you can also have it convert SQLite types to Ruby types. So if it's an integer in SQLite, you get it back as an integer or a fixed sum in Ruby. Um, it can work with in-memory databases, um, and this is crazy fast. I'll show an example of this in a second. Um, so you can just build an in-memory database and then still use all the advantages of SQL to mess with your data. This is a cool feature that's under love too. You can run queries across tables in multiple database files in SQLite. So you can bring two database files together and then do queries based on two separate databases. And you can define SQL functions in pure Ruby code. Um, if you want to add some capabilities to your SQL, you can use just flat out Ruby to do that. So here's what some Ruby friendly data looks like. You can see that I've asked for the results to be returned as a hash and turn on type translation so I can get my SQL types and normal Ruby stuff. Then when I execute my query down here, um, you'll see in the match line that I'm actually referring to fields by name now instead of by position. And also when I pass them into pack, I count on the fact that they'll already be integers, and they are. Um, this is another example of a SQLite query too. I stuck a block on the end of it, and that's how you iterate over the matches line by line. Um, in memory, I redid the whole thing as an in memory database to see if I could get it to load a lot faster. It did load a lot faster. The initial conversion took uh, over seven minutes originally. In this version of the in memory database, it loads in 50 seconds. Um, and then, of course, queries are just, uh, you know, faster than I blink, so fast enough. Um, the only change was instead of specifying the file I want to stick it in, you specify this special colon memory colon, and that's where it comes from. Then the other cool thing here is we're using prepared queries. You can set up a query, and you have your placeholders, and then you can fill those placeholders in at the time where you run the query. So the query's already been parsed and prepared and everything, and it executes very fast. Two more cool SQLite features are attach and functions. Here in attach, we assume I have some user database. And I go ahead and just open that, and then I attach that country IP database I built for the IP to country example. And then that lets me do a query to look up if I have a user's IP address in that user's database, I can look up which country they're in using my totally other database. Um, so that's a really cool feature. And I didn't want to figure out how to convert an IP to an integer in SQL because that sounded painful. Um, so I did it in Ruby instead and defined a new SQL function in pure Ruby called IP to int. I gave the Ruby code to do the conversion, and then I can use it in my SQL statements, and it works just fine. So you can change SQL to whatever you need it to be using pure Ruby code. Um, and then right here, this is another helper I'm using. I fetch the very first row of the results, um, and that is the answer to my query. Lots of cool things to know about SQLite. It's very fun to play with. But I kind of sidestepped the problem, right? A lot of people did it with a binary search. What if we really wanted to do it with a binary search? If you want to do that, I recommend using RBTree, which is a uh, binary tree. And um, even though the Cylons have evolved into these more human forms, they keep around these like metal guys for combat and heavy lifting, right? Because sometimes you just need big guns. Um, binary search is definitely a big gun of computing. Um, you, uh, we use it when we need things to be very fast, right? Um, our B tree is a red-black tree, so if you're familiar with an AVL tree, it's even more efficient than that by a little bit. Um, and our B tree is written in C, so it's got everything going for it, right? Super efficient. So we'll do the IP to country thing one more time. We use a real binary search, but the good news is we don't have to write it or be clever. We'll just use our B tree. This drops the search time below one one thousandth of a second. Less than one one thousandth of a second. Think about that. This is Ruby, right? And we're getting answers in less than one one thousandth of a second. So next time anybody tells you Ruby is slow, you have my permission to give them strange looks. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, 
we can marshal our B tree. It works just like other Ruby objects, and we can spit it out to a disk. That's how we'll get our persistent database. And um, we'll use some bound searching methods to perform the search. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. My setup is totally unchanged except for the require line. Now I'm requiring RB tree instead of SQLite. The load gets a lot easier because RB tree works basically like a hash. So this is the line right here where I'm loading the database. Um, I have to be a little clever here because we're talking about ranges and RB tree really just keys on a single key. So I key it by the low end of the range, and then I just store the high end of the range along with the country, and later I can check to make sure it's below that high end. I'll show you how I do that. Um, and then this is what I mentioned before. You can marshal it out just like you can marshal anything else in Ruby. So spit it to a disk, and you have your tree on your disk uh, persisting. And then the search itself, uh, again, pretty much the same. Uh, this is reading the RB tree back end, so just a Marshall read line there works just fine. And this is the actual search. Um, the cool thing is RB tree has these bounds method. It's upper bound, lower bound, and bound. And you can basically provide an upper bound or a lower bound or uh, a bound at each end. And it will return entries that are as close to or equal to that bound as it can. So I set an upper bound and find the low end of the range that's closest to um, the uh, IP address that the user gave me. And then I make sure that we're still under the high end of that range. That's why the put statement's a little tricky. And then uh, print out the country if we are unknown, if not. RB tree has some other nice features. Somebody asked about uh, 1.9's hash ordering. If you need an ordered hash, RB tree is basically all you need, and you can control the ordering, which is like what you were asking about. Um, RB tree is also it sorted set in the standard library is written to use RB tree if it's available. So if you just install uh, RB tree, sorted set gets 15 times faster on standard iteration. Um, so that's kind of a neat just uh, extra. Here's an example of an ordered hash. This is not ordered like Ruby 1.9's ordered hashes. They're ordered by insertion order. This is ordered by key. See, the keys I put in, it doesn't matter what order I put them in. When I iterate over the hash, they come out in order um, because it's a binary tree and it goes through them in order. So if you want to change the ordering, all you have to do is change what you're using for keys, right? Whatever you order by on the keys, that's the order. Um, and then magically improving sorted set, I just wrote this trivial program that made a sorted set of the entire dictionary, and uh, I just called two array on it because that would force Ruby to put them in order. And this is how I figured out that it's 15 times faster just to have RB tree. The only trick you need to do is you need to make sure you require Ruby gems before you require set, so that set will be able to find RB tree. Another cool uh, library that's under loved is FSDB. That stands for File System Database. This is the first one I've shown that's not a gem. Unfortunately, you can't install it as a gem. Um, but you'll find it on SourceForge. I'll give the URL in a sec. And the readme file has the three magic lines that will install it. It's very painless. So the reason the humans are still alive is because they have really great readers. Uh, they're flexible and quick thinking. Um, and uh, that's important with your data too, right? Because your needs on your data change all the time. You have to stay flexible. Um, data can be in different formats. It can be related in different ways. And um, FSDB gives you a lot of flexibility for both of those. Um, this is the URL of where it's find, found. Be careful with that URL. That's not RubyForge. That's SourceForge. I don't know what that is. Some kind of ancient uh, software tracking system. I, I don't think we use that anymore. Um, it, those, some of you may know I work on Scout, uh, which is a Rails and server monitoring tool. So we do a lot of uh, software monitoring at uh, my job. That means we collect statistics from various servers at regular intervals, and then we later analyze this, mainly in graphing. Um, and on Scout, we let you build your graphs any way you want. You really need to go play with our graphing uh, to kind of see it. We let you choose what data you want to graph side by side and over what period of time and um, show you how that works. It's great for analyzing trends and finding problems and stuff. 
Um, and this turns out to be something uh, relational databases don't do well at all. Time series data is uh, just not something, because even with a good index, it just turns out to be too much data most of the time. And um, so in order to solve this, you got to think outside the box. you got to come up with something different. You need to store the data in a way that you can focus on the part that only matters now, right? Well, FSDB is essentially a hash backed by your file system. So the keys are paths in that hash. And just by building a path, you can drill down to the part of the data you care about. Um, it's it's kind of like a more granular version of a P store, right? If you're familiar with P store at all. Um, and by building that path, you drill down past all the data that doesn't matter anyway. So you don't ever consider it, you don't search it or anything, it's just automatically thrown out. Um, this isn't the exact technique we use behind the scenes in Scout because that's a lot more complicated and a lot less general, but this kind of trick, um, we recently tried to improve our graphing and uh, it was taking us about four seconds or so to generate you know, good graphs. Now we're doing it in well under a second. Um, and you have to go play with our graphing to see how cool that is. I promise nobody does graphing better than Scout does. So um, it's cool to check out. So to give you an idea of what FSDB looks like, this is like a file structure that it would create, right? Um, it, let's say I have some server stats, and then I have them keyed by year, month, day, hour, and then the actual data is in minute files, right? And you can see there at the end that the fork forks because I have the two different hours in there. But imagine if it forked way higher up the tree, like in the year, right? So then when you just make the first part of that path to 2008, you're tossing out all the irrelevant years of data, right? They're never considered. So uh, it can be very efficient. Um, so creating a database, if we wanted to store some time series data, Creating a database looks almost just like it does in SQLite, except you give the name of a directory instead of the name of a file. That directory is where your database will be kept. And then literally you use FSDB like you use a hash, right? The key is just a path. So here I turn the time into a path, ordered by year, month, day, hour, minute. And that dot .obj on the end of it tells it what kind of data I want, which um, uh, FSDB takes dot .obj to mean marshal data. So it marshals it out to the disk and marshals it back in. And then for querying the data, all I have to do is construct the path that goes to the data I want, right? And then I can treat it like a normal hash, DB path, and I get back that Ruby object. Um, or in this case, I build paths to directories above the data. And by using those directories, I get an array of all the things in that directory which I can iterate over and recurse to sum up the data. And then this is just some samples of me using it. I put a few entries in the database and make, ask questions of it to average some statistics. Um, so depending on how many values I give it down the tree is how much data gets averaged. Um, so it's very simple to use, just like a hash. It's multi-thread, multi-process safe. We're going to talk about communication and different processes with Renda here in just a second, but FSDB is another option. You can use it for multi-processing stuff. It has uh, transactions, both kinds, shared and exclusive. And you can define your own formats for files. Let me show you a couple of these. This is what transactions look like in FSDB. If you use the browse method, you get a shared transaction. So other people can be reading while you're reading, but nobody can be writing. Um, and inside this block is your transaction. Replace is your write transaction. You uh, get an exclusive lock on the data, and then you return from the replace block whatever you want to replace the data with. So in this case, I've just added a field to the data. And no one can be in the content while you're replacing. Both of these are um, DRB safe, too. So if you stick to these two methods, you can actually serve an FSDB object over DRB or Renda, uh, which again, I'll talk about more in just a second, but that means you can actually have like a shared hash backed by a file system over DRB. It's pretty cool. And custom formats. Um, this is using FSDB to look at um, PNG images. I just stuck some PNG images in there. 
and I built my own FSDB format. This is all it takes right here. You give uh, some reg expression that, that matches your um, uh, extensions. I told it I needed it to be in binary. And then I didn't make it a write format. I'm not going to write PNGs. But for reading them, I just find some key statistics, their width and their height, right, and return those. And then you can see I use this helper method. Um, FSDB has a few of these helpers um, that uh, let you iterate over items in various parts of the path. And I use this helper to show different images and their widths and heights. So I turn my image directory into a database using FSDB. Um, one last library I'm going to talk about is Renda. Um, Renda is uh, dirt simple interprocess communication. Uh, very easy to talk between multiple processes you have going. Um, and uh, this one doesn't need to be installed at all. It comes with every copy of Ruby, so you don't have to worry about installing it at all. See, I told you we'd get to the girls. Um, the Cylons have um, uh, six. She's a Cylon. She's like the ultimate in PR, right? Because even the Cylons have to network. <laughs> right, for obvious reasons, right? Um, networking is important because CPUs are so easy to come by, right? If you have to do um, more thinking, then CPUs are trivial to come by. You get more processes working on the job. It goes faster. Rinda makes communicating between those processes very easy. It's trivial to pass data back and forth. Um, so just given a random problem, we want to take a scrambled word, run through the dictionary, and see what all it matches. Okay, it's not nothing hard, it just takes time. Um, and this is just a, a placeholder task for any task that requires some processing, right? In this case, we need some I.O. and some very simple comparisons. So the trivial solution, just solving the problem, is this right here. This is the whole trick of the method. If you split whatever word you have on characters, sort those characters, and rejoin them, you gain kind of a unique signature for that word. And any word that has the same characters will have the same signature. So then we can just compare those signatures, and that's how we find matches in the database, right? The rest is just a I.O. loop to loop over the database. But let's say we want to make this go faster. We want to divide the work. Well, that means we got to put more processes on it, right? Um, and we're talking about true multiprocessing, like forking, not like Ruby's threading model, which is not exactly multiprocessing uh, unless one of them is blocked. Um, the problem is, once you have multiple processes, you have to think about, well, how do they talk to each other? Well, Renda comes with this thing called a tuple space, which is like a blackboard, basically, a whiteboard, I think is what it's usually called. But um, somebody can put messages up on there, and then somebody else can take messages off of there. So it's a really simple way to pass messages back and forth. And this task is I.O. bound, so I can't make it very fast because there's only one hard drive in this computer and I still have to read through the entire dictionary. Um, but even this computer has two CPUs with two cores each, right? So that's common now. So I put four processes on it just to see what would happen at half the time uh, doing this search. So the setup's basically uh, nothing complicated. We have to require render tuple space. You see my signature method there again, the cheat of how I compare words. I have a workers variable that holds how many processes we're going to have work through this problem. Then in the actual workers themselves, um, the I.O. code looks a little tricky, but uh, the reason is I'm cutting the dictionary into equal chunks. Um, I figure out, based on which worker I am, which part of the dictionary I'm going to be reading, where it starts and where it ends, and I seek to that part. And it's a little bit tricky because I'm probably going to land in the middle of a word, so I have to go to the next word, et cetera. But basically, all I'm doing there is dividing the dictionary. Then when I figured out which words in my portion of the dictionary match our scrambled word, this is all I have to do to put it up. Um, assuming there's some tuple space out there, I give it the URL to the tuple space, wrap it in a proxy, and then I can write tuples to it. Tuples are just arrays, right, a list of of things. I write the pattern, the original pattern, and what I descrambled it to. Okay? So then to collect the results, all it takes is this. Um, we get the tuple space back. Uh, this process is the one, sorry, that actually creates the tuple space. So you make a new one and you serve it as a DRB object. 
And then to get the tuples out of it, we just call take. That pulls off a tuple that matches the pattern we pass to take. And pattern tuples are really simple. Nil matches everything. So if you put nil in some slot, you get whatever that always matches. Um, everything else is done by triple equals, right? The triple equal operator. So you can use regular expressions, as I've done here, to match against the pattern. Um, you can use you know, a class, as I've done here, to say I want an array in this position. It's just uh, matching just like you would do in a case statement. And this gives me back their answers, their descrambled lists, which I can just print. Rinda has other nice features. Um, you can set expirations for a tuple times, so you can put some message up there and say, this is only relevant for the next five minutes. If they don't take it, then, then it expires. Um, or you, uh, Rinda also comes with a ring server, which you can use to do zero configuration networking. That's like Apple's Bonjour protocol, right? Um, where you can connect to things without even knowing their address and stuff like that. Here's an example of the ring server. <laughs> You have some client start a ring server like this, and you can see what I'm serving up here is a tuple space. And I just give it a tuple space and I say, put this on the web somewhere. Notice I didn't give it an IP address or you know, a URL or anything like that. I just said, put this up there. And then uh, in the uh, other side, when you want to get it back, you just use ring finger, ring finger primary, and get it back for you. That's what I wanted to show you about um, processes going faster and how you can speed Ruby up. But I'll take questions, if you have any. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, what you get? for your slides? What'd you say? URL for your slides? Um, I haven't put them online yet, but I will. I, I will. I'll put them up. Uh, we're, we're working on getting a file server for the conference to put all the slides on, so hopefully we'll have that. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, that's it, thanks. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.